8 and 9 of 1 Peter 3. And uh, we just uh, read those this morning for context. And uh, we're uh, really looking down at verses 10 through 12 this morning, uh, which are related to verses 8 and 9 or flow out of verses 8 and 9. So 1 Peter 3, uh, verse 8 through verse 12. This is God's word eternally true. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called, that, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Here ends our reading. Our response of thankfulness is printed there for you in the bulletin at the bottom left. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. I've entitled this here, Peace on Your Lips, Flowing from a Changed Soul. Uh, whenever you look at a text of Scripture, you want to consider what is being said throughout the whole book of Scripture there. And as we've seen in the past, Peter has been talking about how our souls are changed. Uh, we've been born again. Uh, and one of the effects of this is how we treat others in the church. And that's the section we're in now as he gets to, to verse 8 into verse 9 and then through verse 12 here. How do we treat each other in the church and what's to be our MO, our mode of operation as we, as we interact with one another? And all of this, all of, uh, and, and he's talking about speech here and how we respond to people. Last week we looked at how we respond to our brothers and sisters in the church when they hurt us, when they sin against us, uh, when they insult us. So our brothers in the church, those who are born again when they, when they hurt us or insult us, um, not, not unbelievers, um, not, not those in the church who are, are categorized as wolves, um, but, but to believers. How do we, how do we interact with them? And, and so we, we flow out of this here and we, and we look that, that our speech is to be characterized by something. And that characterization is this, the idea of peace, the idea of peace. And this peace flows from the gospel itself. All of the Christian life comes out of some truth of the gospel. Um, the gospel encapsulates God's character toward us and therefore how we are to be toward other people. And so as we look at this idea of being at, at peace with each other in the church, at peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ, we look at Jesus and we look at the gospel and what Jesus has accomplished for us. So if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, we're, we're on point one here. And the first thing that God wants us to know here from this text and why he inscripturates this is he wants us to know that in the gospel, in the gospel, Jesus has provided for you peace with God. He's provided for you in the gospel peace with God. And so we looked at in our, our bulletin this morning, if you look over in the Declaration of the Gospel, Romans 5.1, Romans 5.1 is that very first phrase there. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have peace through faith in, in Jesus. We had been at enmity with God. Uh, we read that in our uh, declaration of the gospel as well after that ellipsis there. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds. That was true of all of us. Uh, we were alienated from God. We were enemies in our, our minds toward him, not wanting to do his will. That was what we once, what we once were. Uh, and our, we had evil behavior, but it says, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death, making peace, peace, key word there, making peace through his blood. So how can we have peace with each other? Well, because we have peace with God through Jesus. Jesus' blood covers our transgressions. And so we have peace with God now through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so that's the first thing we're to see here, that the whole basis of this is not something new and different, and that it very much is in the character of God, who establishes for us peace with himself through his son's, through his son's blood. And this is what we've come to believe. So all those passages there talk about how we have peace with God. Luke 2.14, uh, it's, it's a message at Jesus' uh, uh, birth and that Jesus comes to, to provide peace for his people. Um, Acts 10.36, the gospel is described as what, what brings peace to God's people. So number two in your outline there, also by the gospel, Jesus provides peace for you in the church. So not only is peace provided for you by Jesus personally with God, and that God is no longer wrathful toward you for the sins you've committed, but he has displaced his wrath upon Jesus. So he has no more wrath for you left because he spilled it out on Jesus. Not only has God given you peace with him personally, but also as a gift to you, he's given you peace in the church peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so A, here in your outline. One thing scripture teaches us is one of the purposes of the gospel. One of Jesus' purposes is, is this, to have peace in the church. So your outline point there, peace in the church is his purpose. Jesus wanted to, to, to rescue you from having to pay the eternal, eternal penalty for your sins, but he also, as part of his purpose in coming to this earth and dying, wanted to provide for you peace in the church. This is his purpose for you. So Ephesians 2, 11, and 11 through 22 talks about this. And, and Bob read uh, to us some of this, and, and we read it in the call to worship. In Paul's day, there was not peace in the church other than by Jesus because there were Jews in the church who'd come to believe in Jesus and there were non-Jews, Gentiles in the church who'd come to believe in Jesus. And ordinarily, these two groups had no peace. But Ephesians 2 tells us in verse 11 and following that part of Jesus' purpose was to take these two men, figuratively men, Jew and Gentile, and to make them one new man in the church. And unlike society outside of the church, where Jews and Gentiles were separate and hated each other, inside the church, Jews and Gentiles had been brought together by Jesus and made one, made one, at peace with each other. So that's Ephesians 2 that we saw in our, our call to worship there. Now, why was peace in the church, uh, ch peace in the church his purpose? Because number one there, Peace in the church is to Jesus' glory. Peace in the church is to Jesus' glory. Ephesians 3, 8 through 11 speaks about this. Um, why is it to Jesus' glory that there's peace in the church? Why does that bring him glory when there's peace in the church? Because it's your next line there. It's only accomplishable. That's really a word. I put it down. I expected it to It'd be underlined as a misspelled word, but it's really a word. Accomplishable. It's really accomplishable. It's only accomplishable by him. When you look outside of the church and different people getting together, maybe they can get together for a while, but eventually there's some break, right? What treaty between nations has ever lasted more than 100 years, right? Usually they last a year or five at the most, right? But peace in the church is to Jesus' glory for it's only accomplishable by him. It's a supernatural thing. Or in other words, next line there, B, it's not natural. Peace in this age between human beings is not natural. Natural is enmity, E-N-M, enmity and war. So we saw this in Galatians 5 that Bob read to us, the fruit of the flesh. What's natural for us apart from the Spirit of God being in us is, Galatians 5, 19, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Here's what naturally comes out of us. 
sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. You know, he's just naming some of the things there. That's what's naturally a part of us. That's what comes out of us apart from the Spirit of God and his transforming influence in our lives. So Paul says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So those who are outside of the kingdom of Christ, those who aren't believers, they act like this. And Paul names these things and says, make sure you're not acting like a non-believer. And part of acting like a non-believer is being jealous and being envious and having discord and forming a faction. Okay, that's what non-believers do. And Paul says, make sure that you don't do that. That's what's natural. That's what's out there in the world. Okay, like John talks about in 1 John 4. You know, the spirit of the world's out there and it does all this kind of stuff, and those who are of the world just follow in that. Okay. Revelation 6.4, uh, we were looking at this this morning in Sunday school. It's describing our era, and it says this, Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. This is a description in a figurative way of our era. Okay? Enmity between men, warring swords. We have to take at great uh, 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 measures in, in companies and in neighborhoods to make sure that there's not war going on because this is who we naturally are. So you have a covenant, you know, maybe in your subdivision, you know, to, to declare what you can and can't do so that people won't be warring with each other. So that's the natural thing to do to be at war with other people, to get mad and to, and to uh, dig your heels in and, and to be at war and enmity and create a faction and envy, that kind of thing. Number two, why else is Jesus um, having a purpose to have peace in the church, to have the church be a haven of peace? Uh, well, not only does it bring him glory because then the church stands out from the rest of the world in the church, peace. Outside of the church, not peace. I feel like Jerry Maguire there. No, that's not Jerry Maguire. That's uh, Night and Day with Tom Cruise. With me, without me. Anyone seen that movie? It's great. Watch it. Uh, Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz. But inside the church, peace. Outside the church, no peace. And so when you look inside the church, you say, what is causing this peace? It's Jesus, and Jesus is glorified. But number two, number two, why else? Because peace in the church is to your blessing. It's a blessing to be at peace. It's a blessing to be in a situation where there's peace around you, where you can walk in and there's no war going on. If you've got a family and, and you're not at war with each other, that's a blessing. You come in the door and you go, whoo. And you plop down on the couch and no one's going to attack you. No one's going to insult you. Uh, no one's going to bother you. Uh, everybody's going to support you. Okay, that's a blessing to be, to be at peace. And, and God has that for you. Look at verse 9 in, in, in 1 Peter 3 there. Jesus has called you. This is part of his blessing for you. And why do you not return insult for insult or evil for evil inside the church? Because Jesus has called you to blessing. He's called you to this, to inherit a blessing. And so the church is to be this place that's a blessing for us. We walk in these doors and say, whew, I don't have to worry about anyone making fun of me for this next hour and a half or this next three hours, depending on when you get here. <laughs> I don't have to worry about being persecuted for believing in Jesus for this three hours. Ah, peace. I don't have to be, worry about someone headhunting me for the position I have. Maybe I've got to deal with that at work. Or maybe at work I have people that are mad at me, but not, not in the church. In the church I come in and say, ah, oh, this is the place where everyone loves me. 
and they see my weaknesses and, and they see my failings and they still and they still love me in here. Christ has called you into the church to inherit this blessing in this age. Not only an eternal blessing of peace forevermore, but a ble the blessing of being in a group of people in the church, being here and being in a place where you can be where you can be at peace. Proverbs 25, 24 says this, better to live on the corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. <laughs> now that's not commendation for you to leave your wife if she's quarrelsome. It's making the point that isn't it nice when in your home there's not quarreling? And that's the way the church is to be. Uh, when we come into the church, we're not to wish we were on the corner of the roof just to get away from the quarreling, okay? It's a blessing, in other words, when there's not quarreling going on, when there's, when there's peace. Okay, so that's uh, Jesus' purpose is to bring peace in the church. Jesus provides for you in the church uh, peace. And so how does he do that? Number three, how does he do that? How does Jesus provide uh, peace in the church? So number three, to accomplish peace in the church, to accomplish peace. Peace in the church, Jesus does a couple of things. To accomplish peace in the church, Jesus does a, a couple of things. Um, a, Jesus changes you and your brothers and sisters on the inside. To accomplish peace in the church, Jesus changes you on the inside. The gospel changes your insides. And I put all these verses here to be obnoxious about it. This is God saying, I'm changing your soul. Uh, John 3, 5 is, is talking about us being born again. He gives us new birth. He changes us on the inside so that there will be peace in the church, so that our brothers and sisters in the church can inherit a blessing and they can walk in the church without us mucking it up with a lack of peace. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul puts it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that that is, if he's a believer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. He makes us new from within, a new creation. Ephesians 4.24, Paul tells us, and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. God gives us a new self a new inward self, a new soul, and it's created to be like God in righteousness and holiness. And by this new self, there's peace in the church. We're all people who have this new self. Ephesians 2.10, Paul says a little bit earlier in that same book, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So we're this work, our souls have been worked on by God. We've been created anew by God to do good works. The gospel's been implanted inside of you. It's growing inside of you more and more. It's your new implanted spiritual DNA. And it's in you and me, and it's working out some of the old DNA, our old self, our sin nature, and it fights with our sin nature. Our new spiritual DNA does so that we can be a person who's not disrupting peace inside the church. That new spiritual DNA from that gospel seed within us produces peace. So on the individual level, how does Jesus accomplish peace in the church? He accomplishes it on this individual level by giving us a new self. Secondly, B, to accomplish this peace in the church, he commands, that's your blank, he commands you to pursue peace to seek it, to pursue it. So he, he wants you to be real sure, not only is he changing you on the inside so that you'll have uh, Ephesians, um, the, the, or Galatians 5, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. So he changes you on the inside to make from your soul as a fruit of the spirit, peace. But also he commands you, having the spirit, he says, pursue peace. And that's right here in our, our uh, um text here in verse 11. Seek peace and pursue it. See that in verse 11? Seek peace and pursue it. And so this is why in our membership vows, in vow number five, when you join the church, it says, 
that you promised to study the purity and peace of the church. You promised to pursue the purity and the peace of the church. You promised this to God when you come into the church as a member, that you're going to pursue the peace of the church. You're not going to disrupt the church. And this is why in our membership or in our ordination vows, both for deacons and elders, our ordination vow number six is even stronger. It doesn't say just to study the purity and peace of the church. It says to pursue the peace and unity of the church. And so ordained men are called to do this, to pursue the unity of the church and not to break that promise that they've made to God. Jesus' purpose is oneness. That's what he prays to his father in John 17, that they might be one, that I might be glorified in the church. That's Jesus' purpose, and he's ticked off when people disobey that. He's ticked off when people divide the church, when they split his body up. He's fighting mad. Remember when Achan does that? Remember when Korah does that? You see what John says in 3 John verse 9 and 10 about Diotrephes who's splitting the church? You see how Paul in Acts chapter 20 weeps with the Ephesian elders because there will be wolves that rise up from the congregation and pull people out of the congregation, out of the church. And he tells the elders, guard against these men. The purpose of the church is unity. If you want to know if someone's not for Jesus, see how he treats the church in regard, for, in regard to its unity. So in other words, for us, God commands us to seek the peace of the church, commands us to pursue it, commands us to live out our spiritual DNA. Colossians 3.10, put on the new self who's being renewed in the knowledge and image of its creator. So how do you seek peace? How do you seek peace? Um, our first inclinations as people, especially if you're a non-conflict oriented person like me, and like I know a lot of you are too, um, our first inclination for pursuing peace is to, is to abandon truth, is to abandon truth. So um, that's your number one there. This is not peace by abandoning what's true. Okay? Um, in church history, there have been groups, uh, first called, uh, there's a group called Pietism in the late 1600s. And, early 1700s, and they thought, well, the church has been at war, there's the Hundred Years War and all this kind of thing, and it's all over church doctrine. So let's not believe specific stuff from the Bible anymore. Let's just say everybody loved Jesus and let's not define it. Let's not define who Jesus is and let's not define how we love Jesus. Let's not define his commandments because that just bring, brings arguments. And so let's, let's abandon all that, that truth. Um, in our day, in the last 100, 200 years, theological liberalism has gone the same route. How do, how do we unify? We abandon the truth. We say, well, let's just, you know, Rodney King, let's just everybody get along, right? <laughs> you know, when I was a, a, a student at Wittenberg University, um, it was a Lutheran school, and, and there, are two, uh, there are three Lutheran denominations, and uh, two of them are faithful to the scriptures, and one of them's not. And, and the one that's not was formed out of, I think, eight Lutheran denominations who came together on my college campus and said, essentially, um, none of us believe this stuff anyway. Why are we apart? <laughs> so they, they joined and, and, and they, they formed the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, uh, the ELCA, which is not the, not the Lutheran church in town. They're one of the good guys. Um, but uh, uh, it's not by abandoning truth, and that's not what we see in scriptures. You, you see there, and that's why we read Genesis 50. How does Joseph get, get peace with his brothers? It's not by abandoning the truth. It's not by pretending what happened didn't happen. 
the brothers come to him and say, you've got every right to be mad at us um, because they sold him into slavery. They thought about killing him, then they sold him into slavery. And, and, and Joseph, on his end, he operates by truth too. And he says in verse 20 of chapter 50 in Genesis, he says, what you did, you meant for evil. That's truth. But God meant it for good. So they don't pretend it didn't happen. They deal with the fact that this did happen. But they have peace together as brothers. Because Joseph says, don't worry. I forgive you. I will provide for you. Okay? So that's, that's our model as believers. When we sin against one another, we pursue peace. We seek peace with one another. But it's not by abandoning, it's not by abandoning truth. Number two, rather, it's peace through truth. It's peace through truth. So we seek peace and pursue it by, and we, we saw those two passages that Bob read to us this morning from uh, Matthew 5 and Matthew 18. So if, in Matthew 18, if someone sins against you, you go to them and you, you, you talk. Or if Matt, in Matthew 5, if you realize that someone has something against you, you go to him. So both ways. You just go to each other and, and, and you talk. And so that's, that's your A point there. When there's sin, one against another, um, first of all, we respect the harmed person. The harmed person. How do we do that? By acknowledging that the sin against him matters. I remember when I was in, uh, um, uh, well, I won't give too much detail, a long time ago, um, there was um, some, some sin that had gone on, and it wasn't against me, but it was against one of my um, friends. And, and uh, I remember talking to and getting some counsel from a pastor in town about this. And, and he brought this point up to me. He said, you know, if someone's harmed, and you say, oh, th that doesn't matter, what you're doing is saying that person doesn't matter. The fact that you were harmed doesn't matter because you're not important. But it does matter. And Jesus cares when we're harmed. And so in the Christian community, we don't, we don't deal with peace without truth because when something harmful has happened to somebody, that matters. And we care. We care that that person has been harmed. Whether we're a third party and we see someone's been harmed or whether we're the one who's harmed somebody and we're confronted with that. When you did this, it, it, it hurt me. Or here's how it affected me. Okay, so the first step, when there's sin, one against another, we don't say it doesn't matter or get over it. Okay, uh, we acknowledge that it matters because that person matters. That person bears God's image. If that person, especially in this context, has the spirit of God, they're a person Christ has died for. So certainly Christ cares for this person, so I should too. So we care for that harmed person, acknowledging that that sin is significant and it matters. But then, how do we go about this? And this is all real practical stuff for us, biblical instruction about how do we have peace in the church. First of all, we acknowledge the sin. And we say this matters that somebody's been harmed. Secondly, B, we either simply forgive, okay? We either simply forgive. That is, you know, somebody harms you or does, does you wrong. Um, you as the one who's harmed can say, you know what, I'm just going to forgive them. That's okay. I'm okay. We're okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forgive that person. And that's what we have to do most of the time, right? We've, we've said it before. If, if you don't do that, then you're always going up to people and saying, when you did this, it hurt me. And you'll spend your whole day doing that. Okay? But if we're having trouble just forgiving somebody, we, we go and, and see. Uh, we talk to each other. We talk to each other. And uh, we just sit with them and we talk to each other. And we talk with each other with the truth of the gospel in mind. And this is very important. We talk to each other with the truth of the gospel in mind, talking with humility, that is keeping in mind our own sinfulness. If somebody's harmed me by doing something to me, I keep in mind I'm a sinner too. And I've probably done that to other people. Even if I don't, you know, I probably can name different times when I've done the same thing to other people. Romans 2, 1 through 4. I do the same things, okay? Do the same sin. But even if I can't, I just grant in my own mind, I've probably done the same things to other people, and they were just gracious and forgave me, and so I didn't even hear about it at any time. And so that's approaching someone with the gospel in mind. 
Humility. I'm not innocent when I go to this, of, of this crime, when I go to this person and confront him or her with, with the same thing that they've done to me. Okay, so we talk with each other with the truth of the gospel in mind, talking with humility, with patience, with love, next blank, with grace, with grace and kindness. So these are all characteristics we see in verse 8. See that in 1 Peter 3, 8? See how 8 and 9 bleed into, you know, the 10 through 12 here. So with kindness, with grace, with love, with humility. If someone's harmed us and we need to go to them, we're, we need to be humble and gracious and patient and, and loving and kind to that, to that person in our minds and in our attitude as we talk to them. Or as Ephesians 4.15 says, we speak to the truth to one another in love. So we go to that person, we go to that person with love. Um, this is not talking with each other to condemn. Okay, so I shouldn't go to that person who's harmed me in order to condemn that person. But I go to that person still speaking truth, but speaking in love and with humility about, my, about myself in order to seek, pursue, and maintain peace. Next D, um, if we're on the receiving end of that, if somebody comes to you and says, you know what you did there um, hurt me, um, we apologize. Uh, we apologize in humility and freely. We apologize in humility and freely. Um, we don't defend. Okay? Don't worry about defending yourself. Uh, and we remember that our eternal, here's your blank, our eternal destiny is not based on our works. Our eternal destiny is not based on our works, and so we can apologize. We can admit our sin. We can, we can have sorrow over how we've hurt somebody else um, because our eternal destiny is not based on what they think of us. Our eternal destiny is not based on whether or not they say, aha, so you admit it. <laughs> if they say that, they say that. But they're not the judge at final judgment. Your judge at final judgment is the same person who bore you that sin in his body and died for it, endured wrath for it already. Okay, that sin has already been punished in Jesus. Or as we put here in the outline, um, and we remember that all your sin, you remember that all your sin is already forgiven through your faith in Jesus. Your sin has been placed, chapter 2, verse 24, your sin has been placed in Jesus' body on the cross. This enables us, see how this, and that's your next line there, how I put it. This is how the gospel seed in you enables you to admit sin. The gospel is not only your ticket to heaven. Your gospel in this life enables you to admit your sin to somebody else even when it's embarrassing. Because your eternity is not depending on that person. They're not your judge. And if they think poorly of you, Jesus isn't going to listen to them at final judgment. He's going to say, yes, I know they mistreated you. And if they're a believer, he's going to say, yes, and I died for that sin. So this person's clean. John's clean here because I've died for a sin. So that enables me, that frees me up to say, yep, and I've done much worse than that to other people, and I'm sorry that I've hurt you. I'm sorry that what I did um, hurt you. I'm sorry that I did that. And, um, and it, it, admit that as, as deeply as, as you know how. Um, that'll heal that other person. Um, you know, when someone's harmed you and you go to them and, and they apologize and they feel terrible about it, the deeper you apologize, the more healed your relationship is. I had somebody um, sin against me clear back in like 99-ish. And he apologized to me then. And about every nine months when I'd see him, he'd apologize to me some more. And each time I, I'd say, you know, that, that's okay, I forgive you. But I realized what was happening after about four and a half years of this happening. He was experiencing progressive repentance over what he had done. And it was really bad. It was really harmful. Um, I remember being in my kitchen 
frozen for three minutes at a time because I was so paralyzed by the harm that had been done to me by something he had done. And it was, I was just kind of caught up in my own mind, making my girls lunches for the, for the uh, next school day. And it was really harmful. Uh, but I really did forgive him. But he realized as time went on how bad a mistake that was and how badly that probably hurt me. And so he experienced progressive repentance there and continued to, to uh, express that to me. But, you know, even, even so, though I had forgiven him back then, each time he said that, I just felt closer to him. And I felt more at peace uh, with him. And I realized um, he, he really loved me as a brother. And that was wonderful. So we apologize in humility and freely, remembering that our eternal destiny is not based on our works and that all our sin is already forgiven through our faith in Jesus. Okay? And this is how the gospel seed in you enables you to admit sin and thereby remain at peace with others. Okay? So we use our lips. I'm really sorry I've done this to you. I wish I'd done differently. Are you okay? Is there anything I can do? We freely admit our sin. Um, we, we won't care about our own reputation. Um, Jesus has taken care of us. And so we use our lips to promote peace in the church um, through, through the truth, through uh, uh, going to our brothers and just talking and talking in love and talk, talking not in a condemnatory way. And then by uh, responding with apology and sorrow over the sin that we've done that's harmed our brother. So number three there, uh, laser in on using your speech in the church to accomplish peace. In the church, say to yourself, how can I use my speech to bring peace into this situation right now? So use your speech. That's the command. That's the, that's the oomph of this text here. Use your speech to accomplish peace in the church. Because outside the church, the way people act outside the church is they use, they use their speech to divide, to cause enmity and strife and war. And in the church, it's to be opposite. And you're you, to use your lips in the church for that opposite effect from that effect in the world. You use your speech in the church to accomplish peace. Number four, um, why? So not pursuing the peace in the church is foolish because it's, it's counter, it's counter to who you are in Christ. That's counter to your spiritual DNA. That's your blank DNA. It's counter to your spiritual DNA. Matthew 5, 9, 5, 9 says the sons of God are those who are peacemakers. Those who are in the church, those who are believers, the sons of God, they're peacemakers. And Jesus says they're the ones who are blessed. We're the blessed people. We're believers. We have an eternity to spend with God. And blessed people act as peacemakers. Okay, so when we act as a contrary to being a peacemaker, we're acting against who we are in Christ. We're acting against our spiritual DNA. Second thing, B, um, not pursuing peace in the church is foolish because it's counter to Jesus' purpose for the church to be a place of peace. And we never want to be acting in a way that's counter to Jesus' purpose. And then C, not pursuing, pursuing peace in the church is foolish because it's counter to Christ being glorified by the fact that in contrast to the world, the church is a place of peace, which he has wrought, which he has wrought. The glory that Jesus gets in the church in bringing Jews and Gentiles and tall people and, and short people and people who like ice cream and people who are lactose intolerant and whatever the differences are in the church. People of all, as we see in Revelation, of all nations, tribes, and tongues, all coming together and being unified. The glory that Jesus gets is great. That all these people who are different, and even in a local church, you know, say we were all born and raised in Clayton. Even if we were that alike, we'd still be very different in our gifts and our, our shapes and sizes, what we liked and what we didn't like. But the fact that we get along together is evidence that Jesus is present among us and Jesus gets the glory for that. So what does God say to us through Peter here? Use your tongue by the power of the spirit that's in you 
that's given you a new self, a new spiritual birth, a new DNA. Use your tongue to bring peace into the church, even when there's insult and injury and evil that's been done to you.